It is our custom to prepare for the study of God's Word by having a few moments of silent prayer. And during that time, we have the opportunity opportunity to uh, name our sins to God the Father, and that ensures the filling of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your word. What would we do without it? We are just uplifted, inspired. We have hope, the confident expectation of the promises that you have made will surely come to pass. You see, the world continue, continually to fall apart. It becomes more wicked every day. And yet, we are still very solid in what we believe. We have courage, we have strength, we have security. It's all because of you and your grace. We pray that you will help us this morning to focus and concentrate on your mighty word. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last Sunday we were in Exodus chapter 4, and this Sunday we're in Exodus chapter 4. In verse 12 of chapter 4, we have, <clears throat> excuse me, we have uh, Moses finally just cutting loose with what the real problem was, and he just asked the Lord, he says, but he said, please Lord, now send the message by whomever thou will. By the way, that's not 12, that's 13. And so Moses is saying, look, send anybody. I don't care who it is, just don't send me. And that's because Moses was thinking about his lack of qualifications and his lack of abilities and think, instead of thinking about God and his abilities. And so he had to learn a lesson there. There's a few verses that Moses could benefit by. Of course, some of these are in the New Testament and hadn't been written yet, but still the principle was there. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13 says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Philippians 4, 13. Ephesians 3, 14 and 16. Ephesians 3, 14 and 16. I bow my knees before the Father. Verse 16 now that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. And then Psalm chapter 42, verse 5. Why are you in despair, O my soul? Why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. One other thing that we covered that was very practical, very pragmatic, and that was when we were making our Moses was making the case about he can't speak and uh, he's slow of speech and he's going to foul up the whole thing. And we learned in Ecclesiastes chapter three verse seven it says there is a time to be silent and a time to speak. The two believers recognize that. Sometimes the best thing to say is nothing. And then at other times, it is critical that you speak. And I think because we live in a world that has gone insane, we ought to speak often when we ever have the opportunity to tell whoever who has ears to hear about the truth of God's Word. And so, by the time we get to verse 14, and that's where we're going to start today, if you'll open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 4 and verse 14. (laughs) 
Okay, we've got Genesis, excuse me, Exodus chapter 4 and verse 14. Now this occurred right after Mo, Moses had wanted to bail out. He made all these excuses and God explained that in every case that uh, he's going to provide a solution. So in Exodus chapter 4 verse 14 says, Then the anger of the Lord burned against Moses. We're going to look at this anger in a moment. But I want you to notice the structure of this verse. It tells us first of all that the Lord's anger burned against Moses. And he said, now you may think because of the first part of this verse that he is going to curse Moses that he is going to excoriate Moses. He is just going to grind him into fine powder because of the way he is responding to all the things that God had told him. But what we find is nothing like that. Just the opposite. Look at your Bible. It says, this is the quote <clears throat> that God spoke. When he got angry, is there not your brother Aaron the Levite I know that he speaks fluently, and moreover, behold, he is coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. So, what we see is that Moses' response to the Lord's plan would make anyone irritated, and God's irritation turned to anger, because now he's just bordering on outright disobedience. He was probably angry at this point because he gave Moses the, the grace he needed because he knew that Moses was afraid. And that would be, anybody would be afraid. But now it looks like his, dis, his uh, fear has turned into disobedience. And God, of course, will not tolerate that. And, but what I want you to see in the verse is that rather than crushing Moses, which he deserved, what he does is come up with a solution to the problem. And there's a message in that for us as well. All of us are going to be angry. Some of us will be angry this very day. Some others will be tomorrow. Somebody, we all get angry, do we not? Now, sometimes we have a reason to be angry. And anger is not always a sin. This righteous indignation when you are angry is not a sin. And this is what God had here was righteous indignation. But when we are angry, most of the time, we're not just thinking about how this is, we're not just angry because of what has taken place. We're angry at the people. And our anger burns against them. And so rather than fi uh, finding a resolution to the problem, we want to take them apart. It's all their fault. How much time have we let, uh, uh, in our lives have we spent wasting that time by arguing with, arguing with someone that you're right and they're wrong and they're saying the same? How far does that go in getting things, making things better? Then doesn't help at all, does it? So what I'm saying is the next time that we get angry, and it's a, a sinful type of anger because we hate the person that for whatever they did, we can switch gears and think, okay, this is the scenario. This is what happened. Now, what is the solution for this? Because that's what God is showing us right here in that verse. God is angry, and then he says, is there not your brother Aaron the Levite? What does that have to do with what Moses had been doing in just really trying to con God out of having to go. Well, it doesn't have nothing, it doesn't have anything to do with that. 
was what Moses had done, but it's about a solution. He says, okay, you don't want to speak because you think that you're uh, a slow speaker and so forth. All right, this is the solution. And he says, uh, is not your brother Aaron the Levite? I know that he speaks fluently. And moreover, behold, he is coming to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now that, t- that part took me by surprise. And I'll have to deal with that in a moment. But first of all, I'm going to talk about a little bit more about this anger. So the Lord had righteous indignation towards Moses, and he still had the composure and poise to offer a solution to the speaking issue that Moses brought up. We all need God's example for solutions rather than seeking vengeance. We have the righteous indignation due to a wrong committed against us. In other words, instead of Seeking revenge, we need to seek a a resolution to the problem. I have a quote from Gleanings in Exodus. It says this. This is by uh, author Peter. The faithfulness of Moses in recording his own sins and the anger of the Lord against him is a striking proof of the divine veracity of the Scriptures. An uninspired writer would have omitted such serious reflections upon himself as these. So Moses is not trying to make himself look good in this. This is Moses who is writing this. He experienced it. And if the Bible had not been inspired by God, the Holy Spirit, then people like Moses would kind of, Erase this little part over here. Maybe add a little part over here that makes himself look better. He doesn't. He includes everything that he saw and what he was, warts and all. And that should be encouraging to us that the Word of God is indeed the Word of God. So God's anger was righteous indignation. And it was legitimate. It wasn't a sin. But note that he did not get emotional or have any mental attitude sins, rather came up with a solution. Can we do that? Y'all can answer that. I want to hear, can we do that? Will we do it? (laughs) Well, nobody's going to say anything of that. Maybe. We hope we do. Now we're going to switch gears here a bit. Because sometimes God uses the word anger and other sometimes sinful things that actually accrue to him. And let me get on the slide show up here. And I'm just going to put this up here. When someone... Or when the Bible says, for instance, God had wrath against so-and-so, or sometimes it even will say that he hated someone, or this type of thing. Those are called anthropopathisms. They get your pen out, get ready to write, because there's a lot of letters in this. And I can't spell a lot of little easy words, but for some reason I can spell these times. They spell A-N-T-H-R-O-P-O-P-A-T-H-I-S-M. Anthropopathisms. Back, I'll put it on the board for you. I have it in red. Now, sometimes the Bible uses an anthropopathism which ascribes human characteristics to God, which he does not possess, in order to explain his actions to humans in a way they can understand. Let's I'm going to say this again, piece by piece. Sometimes the Bible uses anthropopathics. Now that word means it, it ascribes human characteristics to God, which God does not possess. Why does he do that? In order to explain his actions to humans in a way that they can understand. The Greek word anthro comes from anthropos, which means man. 
for mankind. And path, pathism means a function of the soul with an outward manifestation. I'll leave that up there. Of course, this is going to be on the website. It, 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 this is being recorded, supposed to be in the notes, but I wanted you to see it up close and personal. Now, sometimes the Bible uses anthropomorphisms. That's spelled A N T H R O P O M O R P H I S M S. Anthropomorphisms, which describe human physical characteristics that God does not possess in order to explain his actions to humans in a way that they can understand. The Greek word anthro means man and morphism means a form or structure. So anthropomorphisms refer to uh, accrediting man's a structure or form to himself. And then I'm going to give you some examples of this. You don't need to ho hold your breath and uh, push some buttons up here. Okay, everything's well. Here's some examples of anthropopathisms. First one is Romans 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Romans 1, 18. And wrath is just a biblical term for anger. Psalm 41, excuse me, Psalm 94, 1. Psalm 94, 1. O Lord, God of vengeance, God of vengeance, shine forth. So he's even being called God of vengeance. Vengeance is a sin, but not when it's used as an anthropopathism for God. And then you have Psalm 78, verse 58. Psalm 78, verse 58. For they provoked him, capital H, the Lord, with their high places and aroused his jealousy with their graven images. Jealousy is a sin. He's talking about God's jealousy, but again, that is an anthropopathism that accrues this word, that this, this sin that God does not have, but in order to help us understand what he's trying to give us. I've got one more here, and we're going to spend a little time on this one. Uh, put a marker where you are now in... Uh, Exodus, and turn to Romans chapter 9, verse 13. Romans chapter 9 and verse 13. We're not too far from that. We're in Romans 8, 28. We'll be in Romans 9 before long, Lord willing. Yes, it's Romans 9, verse 13. Romans 9, 13. It says, just as it is written, and I'll show you where it's written in a moment, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. I've looked all over the Bible as best as I could. And this is the only place that I found where it states that God hated a person. 
The only thing, this is not, the, the context of this is not that God hated Esau, which we'll see in a moment. Thirteen. Nine thirteen. Jacob was a believer who represented the nation of Israel, who were God's chosen people and whom he made covenants with. Esau was an unbeliever who represents the nation of Edom who constantly rejected God. So it's not about God loving Jacob and hating Esau because it's not talking about them directly. It is talking about the nations that came from them. Now, Rebecca was pregnant and she was having a real problem with her birth. And so... We find that one problem was because there was, she had twins, well not twins, I guess they were born at the same time. They certainly didn't look like each other. And, well let me, let me turn to that part. Okay. <clears throat> Verse, let's start with verse 10, Romans 9 and 10. And not only this, but there was Rebecca also when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born and had done, and had not done anything good or bad in order that God's purpose according to his choice might stand up. <clears throat> according to his uh, choice, might stand, not be because of works, but because of him who calls. It is said to her, the older will serve the younger, just that it, as it is written, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. So, I'm telling you, I just showed you that this is not about God choosing one person to love and then choosing one person to hate. He doesn't do that. He's talking about the nations that would come from them. And uh, if you put your, uh, well, I guess you don't have to go there. I'll just uh, give this to you. In Genesis chapter 25, verse 23, you need to mark that one down. Genesis 25, verse 23. When it said in verse 13, it is written, this is one of the places it is written, and this is what it says, Genesis 25, 23. And the Lord said to her, Rebecca, Isaac was her husband, two nations are in your womb, and two people shall be separated from your body, and one people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So, and that is referring, of course, to Romans chapter 9, verse 13. Then we have Malachi chapter 1, verse 2 through 5. The Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. So just go over there to... I, I would like for you to, to go ahead and go to this one. That's Malachi chapter 1. We'll just start with verse 1 and go through verse 5. You know, there's Bibles in the center of, of each row if you don't have a Bible. It's Malachi, not Malachi. Okay. Verse 1. The Ark of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. Verse 2. I have loved you, says the Lord. Verse 3. But you say, How hast thou loved us? 
Was not Esau Jacob's brother? Declares the yard. Yet I have loved Jacob. And then verse 3. But I have hated Esau. So what we saw in Romans 9.13 was taken from this. So verse 3 says, But I have hated Esau, and I have made his mountains a desolation, and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. Now, I hope you got in verse 2 when it says, that when God said that he loved you, and then they say, but the, as it, as it were, the nation was Edomite, or the Edomites, Edom. The Edomites from Edom came from Esau. And so they're asking him, they're challenging him. Why do you say you love us? And then they bring up Esau, Jacob's brother, and, he's, and, and they quote, Yet I loved Jacob, but I hated Esau, and I have made his mountains desolation, and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. See, these things are not directed towards a person. It is directed towards a nation, and we saw in Genesis chapter 25 verse 23 chapter 25 verse 23 that says the Lord said to Rebecca two nations are in your womb this is talking about nations not talking about a person verse 4 though Edom says we have been beaten down but we will return build up the ruins thus says the Lord of hosts so they're saying okay you hate you hate Esau, which means you hate us because we are the Edomites that came from Esau. And you may bring us down. You may beat us down, but we'll return. We'll just build right back up. They're saying this to God. They may build this. Now God is saying what he's going to say. He says, they may build, but I will tear it down. And men will call them the wicked territory and the people toward whom the Lord is indignant forever. Verse 5. And your eyes will see this and you will say, the Lord be magnified beyond the border of Israel. So I was giving you examples of anthropopathisms and when you come to that one, it is unique. I, I can't find anywhere in the Bible where it says God hates so-and-so, except here. So I'm bringing this into the proper perspective because I find the Bible saying over and over and over that God is love. John 3, 16. What does that say? Go ahead and say it. How's that start? For God so loved the what? The world. And that was referring to the people of planet Earth. God does not hate people even when they reject him, his word, or the gospel. He certainly does not choose to hate some people and love others, which a lot of people think that's what that is saying. In John, turn to John chapter 3. In verse, this is, you, you should know this. Sometimes if you're talking to an unbeliever, it should be one of the first places you go. And that's John chapter 3, it's loaded. So in John chapter 3, verse 14 through 17. Now this is, the reason I'm giving you these verses because it contradicts the idea that God hates some people and loves other people. God loves all people. So here we go with 
John chapter 3, starting with verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him have eternal life. I want you to underline whosoever. That means anybody. It's unlimited. Whosoever. And then John 3, 16. Pete just said it, but we can't. You you know this one anyway, but I'll read it. I don't have to read it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And there you see right from the very beginning, for God so loved the world. That includes everyone. And then verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that through the, but that the world should be saved through him. Not just certain people. When Christ died on the cross, he died for all mankind. So that particular scripture that I'm showing you has no standing other than it being nations and God. I, what I'm saying is God loved Jacob and he loved uh, Esau as well. He loves everyone. Here's a few more verses you can add. First Timothy 2, 3 through 4. First Timothy 2, 3 through 4. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Listen to this, verse 4. Who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That is God's desire. Now if he hated someone, that would not be true. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 19. Second Corinthians 5, 19. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself and not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. That means our job is to give the gospel. Now, that verse is so important because what it's saying is if God was in Christ, which he was, and reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, that means that nobody goes to hell for sins because Christ took care of the sin problem for everyone on the cross. Now you say that to some people and get ready for a fight. They hate it. They don't believe that. And the reason is because they've been working their tail off for maybe decades trying to get to heaven and you just cut them off at the knees and said, that's all crapola. Doesn't mean a thing. The only thing that matters is faith alone in Christ alone. Then we have 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. 1 John 2, 2. And he himself Jesus Christ is the propitiation. I'll spell that word for you. P-R-O-P-I-T-I-A-T-I-O-N. P-R-O-P-I-T-I-T-A-O-N. And it means satisfaction. So he himself, Christ, is the satisfaction for our sin. God accepted the atoning work of Christ on the cross as payment for our sins. He was satisfied with what Christ did on the cross. So he himself is the propitiation of our sins. And it says, and not only, not only for ours, and not for ours only. I read that wrong. He himself is the satisfaction for our sins, and not for ours only, but for also those of the entire world. That means... When Christ said it is finished, it was finished for every person on earth when he was on the cross. The reason I'm saying this is so you won't get bamboozled into thinking that uh, God hates someone. Now, I have some more examples of anthropomorphism. Remember, anthropomorphism is when... Uh, Physical characteristics are ascribed to God, which he does not have. And here's a few that I'm talking about. Isaiah 53, 1 is an example. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? 
Now, God is a spirit. He doesn't have arms and eyes and ears and all that. That's John 4.24 will tell you that God is a spirit. Psalms 34.15 says, The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. So you have two anthropomorphisms in that one verse. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. Okay, we're done with anger. We're done with Jacob and Esau. And we're going to get to the last part of this verse. What is it, 14? I think it is. Let me see. We'll have to wait up here and find it. Yeah, verse 14. Okay, the last part of this verse, now we're, I wanted to handle those issues, so I thought it might be helpful to you. The last part of verse 14 says, and moreover, behold, he, referring to Aaron, and Aaron is spelled A-A-R-O-N, is coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. So what can we conclude from that? Well, God had stirred the heart of Aaron to go and find his brother. And it appears that Aaron actually had found Moses when he was there at the burning bush talking to God. Because he's saying, he was angry, but he says, what about your brother? He's he's an eloquent speaker. And we, you can use him. You won't have to do the talking. And moreover, behold, he is coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now, I understand that that doesn't mean necessarily that he was there. You could say, mean that the whole, he is coming out to meet you. That means, where was Aaron? Aaron was in Egypt. And Aaron had to travel from Egypt all the way to wherever he was going to meet Moses. It could have been halfway there, but there are other scriptures that we'll see in just a moment that says he met him um, at the Mount of God. That, and where was, where, remember, it was, it's called Horeb. Horeb and Sinai both are synonyms for the, the very mountain that God was talking to Moses. That's what, that's where they were, was on Mount Horeb, Sinai, or it came to be known as the Mount, mountain of God. So that means it had to be there, but we'll just, Press on with that. Exodus chapter 4, verse 27. This is one of the verses I was speaking about. It says, Now the Lord said to Aaron, Go to meet Moses in the wilderness. So he went and met him at the mountain of God, and he kissed him. Now, of course, you're not kissing on the lips or anything. They still do this in the Mideast. They you know, go to each side of the cheek. But he met him at the mountain of God. So it appears that when God was wrapping up what he was saying to Moses, and, of course, Moses didn't know Aaron, was his brother, was looking for him, nor that he was about to, to meet him. But it's, he met him at the mountain of God. And this tells us how... This came to be. Okay, let's go back to Exodus. Exodus chapter 4. See, that was verse 14. So we're going to look at verses 15 through 17 because they all Connect. Are you turning your Bibles? Are you at Exodus chapter 4 and verse 15? 
Verse 15, and you are to speak to him and put the words in his mouth and I, even I, will be with your mouth and his mouth and I will teach you what you are to do. Moreover, verse 16, moreover, he shall speak for you to the people and it shall come about that he shall be as a mouth for you, and you shall be as God to him. I'll explain that in a moment. Verse 17. And you shall take in your hand this staff with which you shall perform the sign. So what God is doing is reassuring uh, Moses that he doesn't have to be concerned about being slow in speech. His Speaking ability had no consequence because now Aaron is going to speak for him. And <clears throat> so he, that wouldn't be a problem. That's what we see when we saw, first of all, mainly in verse 15. He said, I will be with your mouth. And sometimes I wish God would be w with my mouth and he would keep it shut. That's what I... <laughs> Well, anyway, maybe you can identify with that as well. Because once you say something, it's, you can't take it back. It's out. So that was verse 15. But when we get to 16, it's saying something a little bit different. He says, moreover, he shall speak for you to the people. That is, when he gets back to Egypt. And it shall come about that he shall be as a mouth for you, and you shall be as God to him. So this part about you shall be a God to him, it meant that Aaron would speak to the people for Moses, even as Moses would speak to Aaron for the Lord. Now, what is stated here in Exodus 4, 16 is also explained in Exodus 7, verse 1 and 2. So we're just right there closest. Cruise over here to chapter 7. And verse 1 and 2, he really expands, comes at it from a different perspective, and it's, it's, I like this one better. He says in verse uh, chapter 7, Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I make you as God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. That connects with me better. I mean, there, there, of course, Aaron wasn't a prophet, and... Moses was not God, but he says in, you'll be acting in that capacity. So he says, then the Lord, this is uh, Exodus 7, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, see, I make you as God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet, because Moses was speaking the word of God and in that capacity, and then your brother Aaron shall be your prophet, and it wasn't the words that came directly from Moses, it, they came from Aaron. And so it'd be like God telling the prophet what to say, only in this case, it would be Moses telling Aaron what to say. We'll get back to verse... Uh, just a little bit here. Okay, verse 17. And you shall take your hand, take in your hand this staff with you, and shall perform signs. Now this staff becomes really important. We're going to see in, uh, let's see, where is it? Uh, verse 20, it's called the staff of God. Because God is going to use this staff, which is only a stick. But he's going to use that when Moses is holding it for his omnipotence, his power to work through that. It was just a stick. It had no power. But when God used it in Moses' hand, that's when all these miracles were going to take place. And that's one reason it's called the staff of God, which was, we're getting to that place. Verse 18 and 19. Verse 18 says, Then Moses departed and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go that I may return to my brethren who are in Egypt and see if they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. 
that seems it, it, like it was pretty much unconsequential. However, this is something that we need to pause and look at in a moment. God told Moses, hit the road. You're going back to Egypt. But he didn't start in the direction of Egypt, did he? He started in another direction, going to Jethro, his father-in-law's house. And it was a huge credit to Moses that he did that because it was the right thing to do. Verse 18 speaks volumes of the capacity of love that Moses had for others, especially Jethro, his father-in-law, who deserved respect and gratitude that Moses extended to him. Jethro was kind to Moses for 40 years. He gave him his daughter to marry. He was an outstanding, uplifting guy. And of course, he was uh, older than Moses at this point. Moses responded in kind, being kind to him, considerate, and thoughtful as he asked permission to go back to Egypt. So we see in verse 18, please let me go that I may return to my brethren to see if they're still there and so forth. That took humility on Moses' part. And, you know, it's, it's, all that has pretty much evaporated. You don't hardly see that anymore. But there are times when we can respect and honor somebody that deserves it. I remember um, when I went when I married Carrie, I went to her father to ask her to ask him if she would give her he would give his hand to her in marriage. Uh, I don't know what to say that. Anyway, I asked him, and everybody was happy about it not, but it, it could have been just a, a something that I could pass because who does that these days? Where the guy actually goes to the, his fiance's father and asks for permission. Well, that was the formal and right thing to do. That's what Moses is doing here. Now, I have a son-in-law, and he came to me and asked me if I would... Uh, allow him to marry my daughter. And I remember we were over at, uh, it was someplace, I think it was uh, Chili's. Maybe not. But anyway, we were at a place like Chili's. And he said he wanted, he invited me out. He was going to go through Brenham. He invited me to lunch. Well, I pretty well already thought two, two, two together. And <laughs> He sat there, and we were there two hours. And we talked about everything in the world you can think of. And I, 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 more than once, I said, well, go ahead and spit it out so we can believe. Well, you just... And finally, after nearly, it seemed like two hours, maybe it wasn't that long. And he, 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 he got up the gumption, and he spit it out. And I said, oh, of course, you know, everything. But that's the right thing to do. You should give credit and respect and honor to people who deserve it, especially if they are older. So this was a, a wonderful thing that Moses did. But there is something that is odd, I believe, because the scriptures do not say anything about him telling his father-in-law, uh, Jethro, about God talking to him at the burning bush. I mean, if it were me, I'd have my track shoes on. I'd be there, and the first thing I'd do is spill in the beans. I'd just say everything about what happened. Not a word. Another question is, Aaron is not mentioned either. And if he was with Moses at Mount Horeb, and then they went together, nothing is said about that. The Scriptures are silent about that, nor anything about Aaron being with Moses, if indeed they had already met. I'm talking about, it, it seems to me like they have to be, but if somebody came in and showed me something different, I would, uh, that it, that's not how it went. 
I wouldn't argue with it. This is what's okay. Verse 19, let's go ahead and get that while we're here. Uh, now, the Lord said to Moses and Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. So he informed Moses that the people who wanted to kill him, and it was, remember when he was going to help his brethren, to his credit, he rejected all of the power and the wealth. He could have anything he wanted to because he was going to be the next Pharaoh. He took God all away in order to be with his brethren. He was a Hebrew. And he blew it by uh, getting in a fight with with an, uh, with an Egyptian and he died and so Pharaoh was going to have him killed. They put a hit, put a hit out on him. And so in the people his own brethren that he went to saw what happened and they they just scorned him. So everything was bad. But now all that has been transformed and now he's going to go back and not have those people against, uh, uh, after him, I'm sure, which was a comfort to him. That's what God does in comforts. We're going to end here because, wow, next Sunday... It's going to start out with a bang. Um, just I'll give one little hint of what's going to happen. Moses and his family are going to take off towards Egypt. And at some point along the way, God is threatening to kill Moses. I mean, it was very serious. And we'll get to that next time I saw us. Okay, this last portion of the service is for those who are wondering what's going to happen to me when I die. And you try not to think about it, but it keeps popping up. Most people think that they that, that their sins are the issue. Because most people, even the atheists, uh, know that they're sins. I, I don't know if any of you have ever talked to anybody who said that they had never sinned. I, but I never have. I'm, I'm ready for them if they do. Because if they tell me they never sinned, I say, you just did. But anyway, um, the problem is not your sin because Christ paid for your sins on the cross. The issue is, are you going to put your faith in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross? Or are you going to rely on your own good works, which God sees as filthy right? The moment that you are persuaded that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, He went to the cross and died for your sins. He was buried and rose from the grave, and now He will give, as a gift, eternal life to anyone who puts their faith alone in Christ. You don't have to raise your hand, walk an aisle, or do anything. When you do that, at that moment, you are born again. You were born physically, now you will be born spiritually. You don't have to worry about heaven anymore because you are a royal family member and you absolutely are headed for heaven. Now, I would suggest that you don't put this off because we live in a very volatile world these days. Let's close. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this narrative of Moses we see ourselves in him. When we see the things that he did that were just didn't make sense, we're looking in a mirror. And then we always see the faithfulness of our great God and how he loves us so much and that he always has a way for us to be able to go through the storm go through the trials and we're better on the other side. We pray that this Christmas season that we will be at the ready to tell people about the truth, whether it's about Moses or whether, especially if it's the gospel. Because this is what we are commanded to do and it should be a privilege. So we thank you for these things and we pray it in Jesus' name.